Ariel's contract at ESPN was coming up in like June 2021. And he didn't tell me explicitly, but I could kind of read between the lines that he was probably going to leave ESPN. And he had pretty much assured me, if I'm out, I'm going to try to find a way to get you with me too in whatever I end up doing. So that kind of gave, I knew I had that in my back pocket too, that I just had to, had to wait a couple months for that to happen. And so June 21 rolls around, Ariel's out at ESPN. He's talking to a bunch of different people. And he actually asked me um, for the MMA hour. He asked me if I would be interested in working on that. Um, they didn't like have anything official. This was all still very preliminary. And I said, actually, that I wasn't interested. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. I'm so excited to be speaking to my guest this week. He's my friend. He's my colleague. He actually is my producer. He works on this show. He does a lot more than that. He has worked for ESPN. He currently works for Spotify. He works with a lot of different people in the fight game, producing some of the best podcasts and shows in the business. And he's now also an author. We're going to get to that in a little while as well. Please welcome my guest, Troy Farkas. Troy, TST, how you doing? Sandy, thank you so much for having me. I mean, I think this was the, the best introduction that you've had thus far. So kudos to you. I think so too. I think we should just uh, <laughs> add this as a strap to every future podcast down the road. Um, this is a nice, this is a fun one. I feel like I'm just talking to a friend because like you and me, we speak pretty much every day. We, we catch up once or twice a week when we're you know making these shows. Here's where I'd like to start with you, Troy. You know, Pre-ESPN, you know, you, you, you get to ESPN and that for a lot of people, you know, in the sports world, in the content creation world, in, in, the, in the producing, production, you know, world is, you know, the goal is to get there. But what was the route to ESPN? Like, is that what you always want? Like becoming a producer, is this what you always wanted to do? What was your path to getting to ESPN? It was not what I wanted to do. In fact... I, I'm jealous of our mutual friend Ariel Hawani and, and many people like him who grew up with a singular dream. They always had an answer to the question, what do you want to be when you grew up? I never had that. When I was four years old, I actually, the only time I ever, ever had an answer was when I was four years old. I told my parents I want to be a doctor, a waiter, and a lawyer, and a Yankees player, all at the same time. None of those came to fruition. But at some point, I you know, had to make a choice. I was a big U.S. history buff. So I actually ended up majoring in U.S. history with no intention of really doing anything with it. But I come from a media family. My mom and dad were newspaper uh, writers and editors, and they met at a newspaper in California. So the, the media thing was kind of in my blood. But I never wanted to do it. I never wanted to follow their path because I want to carve my own path. But then I was in college and I didn't have much going on outside of classes. And so I needed some hobbies. And my brother who had just started, my older brother who had just started uh, working at a local radio station said to me, this radio thing that I'm doing is kind of fun. Why don't you look into your campus radio station? A lot of them have it. So that's exactly what I did. And so I went to the University of Albany in upstate New York, not a media school whatsoever. So there was no competition really for me to get involved from the get go. Started doing the radio thing. Pretty soon I had my own weekly sports talk radio show and I was broadcasting for our basketball games and all that stuff. And then I parlayed that into an internship at our the local Albany ABC affiliate. And then just each year at college, I kept building from student radio to TV to newspaper, more internships. I interned at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York for a summer, which was really cool. So I just ended up getting all this amazing experience, this hands-on experience, more so in the classroom, because the classroom at the end of the day, like media is, a, is kind of a thing where you can study a lot in the classroom, 
but you're really not learning until you're getting your hands dirty and you're making a lot of mistakes, of which I made many mistakes. And then I graduated from college in three years, and I was applying, 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 applying to some, to some history jobs, but also to some media jobs. I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And the only thing that I really wanted to do was I wanted to make a documentary. I wanted to kind of combine my loves of media and of history. I loved watching the History Channel. And I also loved watching sports documentaries, like 30 for 30. So I was like, maybe I can do sports docs. Maybe I can do history docs. Either way, I just want to play some type of role on a documentary. One of the jobs I applied for was as a production assistant at ESPN in the audio department, which I wasn't leaning toward audio. I more so wanted to be in the TV video thing, but the audio just happened to be the path to ESPN. Got a job there uh, in the summer of 2017 at age 21. And that's how it all started. So does it feel like you ended up getting into the family business in any, in exactly. any case? It's exactly right? what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't intend for it to happen, but it's exactly what happened. Yeah, it's funny how that works out. Well, look, you know, you do arrive at ESPN and, and you're there from 2019 to 2021. And you are working on some, you know, high profile shows and podcasts, The Sporting Life with Jeremy Shapp, obviously DC and Elwani, The Hoop Collective, Tom Brady's religion of sports. But there was something when I was reading your book, which obviously we're going to get into more detail later on, that stood out to me right from the jump. You described the experience at ESPN. You said it sucked. And you said that the work was meaningless. Could you give me some insight into that period of your life and, and why it is the way it was? Yes. Yeah, so when I started in summer of 2017, I started as a production assistant in radio. Radio, which I'm no longer in now in podcasting, but radio is, as you know, 24-7, nights, weekends, holidays, nonstop, and sports never stop. And when you're the young person on the totem pole, you're asked to do all of the dirty work, all of the stuff that no one wants to do. So I'm working, mind you, this is, I graduated college a year early, so all of my best friends are still enjoying their final year of college, which, which I never got to have. And I, and I don't regret that because it led me to, you know, allowed me to start, start earlier and, get, and really get ahead of the game, but it was still hard. And so I'm living in central Connecticut, mind you. I'm not in New York City. I'm not in Los Angeles. I'm in Nowheresville, USA, where the winters are cold and dark. And so I immediately start working 6 p.m. to 3 a.m. or in some cases 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the winter. I'm walking to my car, which has snow on top of it at 4 a.m. and I just want to go home and I'm just so tired and I'm doing work, you know, again, like you're not doing the stuff that you want to be doing immediately. You're pressing buttons. You're just keeping the shows on air, the radio shows on air, and your off days are Monday and Tuesday. So you're working weekends, try having a dating life, being like, hey, baby, like, come meet me for dinner on a, a 6 p.m. on Monday in Connecticut when everything is closed. It was very hard. Social life was hard to have, uh, pretty non-existent. And it was just a really lonely, dark time in my life because here I was at this great place and everyone on the outside world probably thought, oh my God, he's at ESPN. This is incredible. But meanwhile, it's midnight on a Saturday. I'm scrolling through my Snapchat stories and all my friends are having the time of their lives in college. And I'm kind of just like wasting away. And, you know, I wasn't sleeping well because my body clock was all over the place and I, I was not eat it my because like my uh, schedule was off so my I wasn't eating well I lost uh, I'm a skinny person I lost 20 pounds and when I came back for uh, like went back home for Christmas break uh, I had a family friend say to me Troy you look awful because I was just so like the life was completely gone from uh, gone from my eyes and so it was a really tough time and, and it lasted for about 18 months Wow. And was there even a sliver of a silver lining anywhere there in terms of, well, okay, all of this sucks, but hey, you know, I'm working with this guy and, and this journalist or this sports person. Was there any kind of positivity you could take away from that experience? Yes. I completely threw myself into one of the shows that you mentioned. That was The Sporting Life with Jeremy Shapp. When I was in college and I was 
thinking about my future, Jeremy Schapp was hosting the show E60, which is just a wonderful uh, sports journalism kind of documentary show. And Jeremy was an idol of mine. And so within my first few weeks at ESPN, I noted, I didn't even know Jeremy Schapp had a radio show, uh, but I found that out and hit up the producer and said, hey, Jeremy's my idol. I would love to help you out with this show. If you need any assistance, let me know. I got you. And that producer, uh, Dan Tukhshevsky, was very uh, open to that. And he let me come in. And, my, and on my first day, he introduced me to Jeremy over the phone. It was Jeremy's birthday. He said, hey, Troy, uh, here's Jeremy. Jeremy, me, Troy. It's Jeremy's birthday. And I said, happy birthday, Jeremy. And like, my, I'm talking to my idol immediately. And that was not a part of my job responsibility whatsoever. In fact, it actually interfered with some of my main job responsibilities. And I was definitely getting an earful from other people about it, about like, hey, you're focusing way too much on this thing that you weren't brought here to do, that it's taking you away from this other stuff. But I didn't care because that ultimately what I was doing with Jeremy was really fulfilling. We were telling meaningful stories, covering all sports, not just the NBA and the NFL, like the stories that we weren't traditionally covering on ESPN radio. And I loved it and it was fulfilling and I gave way more to it than I probably should. But that was the thing that I was hanging my head on. And that honestly, ultimately, that experience is what led me to get out of that hell that I was in because it was also kind of uh, it had podcasting elements to it. And so the podcasting bosses at ESPN took notice, saw what I was doing, that I had the skill set for podcasting. And that was kind of what paved the way for me to get out of radio into podcasting. Love it. And this is where you and me have a little bit of um, a situational situ uh, you know, commonality here, Troy, because you leave ESPN in 2021 and essentially you set yourself up as a business. You know, you go into the freelance world. I did the exact same thing. In 2019, I leave ESPN and I go into the freelance world and I set myself up as a business as well. In the days and weeks leading up to that decision, I was very anxious. I was very nervous about what I was about to do. Could you describe to me how you were feeling as you were kind of going through that process of leave, leaving ESPN? Because it's not an easy thing to do. There were all sorts of emotions. And I say that because... At the end of 2020, obviously 2020, a very tumultuous year uh, in the world, but also in the media landscape and also at ESPN, when there's no live sporting events, your, your bottom line is going to be hurt. And so because of that, I'm over here in podcasting, loving my life, though. Everything is great. You know, the UFC world was still was still booming. So it didn't really interrupt my workflow at all, which I was very grateful for. But ESPN at the end of 2020 laid off a bunch of people and unfortunately they they've laid off a bunch of people since then but a lot of the people that they laid off were people at ESPN radio and so they called me and said hey Troy we just laid off a bunch of people in radio we know we know you're loving life and podcasting right now but you're the only one here with radio experience we, we want you back and I through a fit about that because I had left the radio world. I was loving podcasting at that moment in time. I had just worked on that documentary that I had always wanted to work on, a three-part series about um, Giannis Antetokounmpo, the NBA player. And I was loving life. And then they were tried to bring me back. And, and the way that they spun it to me, I, I really didn't like it. They, viewed, they said, oh, this is an amazing opportunity, blah, 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 all that stuff. And I knew it wasn't for me. I knew it was just taking steps backward. And so that kind of left a, uh, a bad taste in my mouth. And so from that moment on, I was like, all right, I'm 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 leaving. I'm leaving within a couple months. I, I just need to like form some semblance of a plan. And so I had all the all these emotions of, of anger, of being scared, of what's next. But I was able to, along with the help of uh, Ariel, land a gig in freelancing with Chael Sonnen on his podcast. He had an, he, he didn't like, you know, it's not like it's a job posting, but the person that he was working with at that time just kind of wasn't coming through. And so they were looking for someone else. And I decided in that moment, you know what? I'm actually really liking this MMA thing. At that point, I had only, I've been working on it for less than a year. Or no, that's wrong. Like, yeah, like a year, year and a half-ish. And I was really getting into it. And I really liked it. And it was clearly on the up and up. And I said, you know what? Everyone wants to go be 
in NBA and NFL, but let me go be the guy for MMA podcasting. Yeah, I think there's something here. I think there's an opportunity. And so right off the bat, um, I had a couple conversations with Chael and his people and landed a gig working with Chael. And that went and that was I landed it while I was still at ESPN. And so the second I landed that, I was like, I'm out. See ya. <laughs> wow. I mean, Ariel Helwani did the exact same thing for me. It's, it's, it's crazy yeah. how we both had a similar path. You know, I go into freelancing, Ariel makes a few phone calls and opens a door for me to, to join the PFL at that time. And, and that's sometimes all you need. When you, when you set up your own business, you go into the freelance world, you just need that first domino to fall. But for you, this has worked out fantastically well. You know, like you mentioned there, you, you, you're producing Chael's show, You're Welcome. You're also producing Chris Weidman's show, Won't Back Down. You're producing my show, but you've also got your own podcast, The Found Generation, oh, yeah. which you've been uh, running for three years now, three years and change. Um, if For folks that don't know about it, what is The Found Generation and what is the goal of your show there? So it started in the fall of 2020. It was originally called the Troy Farkas Show because I had no idea what else to call it. I had no goal other than I just wanted to use it as a way to catch up with people. I was so, you know, this is still the pandemic when days are pretty dark. And so I just wanted a way to talk to more people. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, like people are pretty flaky in nature, but I, I thought, you know, if I could get them to come on a podcast, it would be a great way to have conversations with them. And this ended up being friends or people from a past life, people I hadn't spoken to in ages that I've been meaning to catch up with. And just like making it in an official podcast setting made them more likely to say yes and stick to it. So that's what it originally started as was just a way to catch up. But then I once I grew out of that, I was like, all right, I want to keep doing this. How do I how do I push it forward? And so it's it's evolved over time. It's fall, I've traveled and lived in a bunch of different places. So it used to be kind of like a travel podcast. What's going on in Troy's crazy life thing? Uh, but within the past year and a half, I renamed it, rebranded it as the Found Generation Podcast, which is essentially uh, I'm obsessed with self improvement, with getting the best out of your life. And so me and my guests that I have on, again, a lot of them are still friends or they're people. Uh, in the work world that I've come across, or sometimes they're just people on Instagram that I like their vibe and I want to talk to them. And we just catch up and we talk about what's going on in their lives. What are they struggling with? I love knowing what people are struggling with to see, uh, you know, A, if there's any commonalities with me, B, if there's any commonalities with the listeners, we're all going through something. And so, yeah, it's just to show that I, I use as a, as a way for to, you know, to let other people feel feel heard and seen. That's something that we all need. It's an avenue for me as someone who works in podcasting to kind of like tinker with different types of podcasting. Um, I've learned all sorts of things. So everything I've learned about the podcasting industry really has come from what I've done on my show. And I have so much fun doing it. And I'm uh, going to have a new season coming out soon, which I'm really excited about. So this is great. So back in, you know, 2000, 2001, it seems, well, 2020, 2021, it seems like it's all coming together for you. You know, yeah. you're, you've left ESPN, you, you're feeling better about life and your work, you're producing some of the biggest shows in MMA, you've got your own podcast, and then the opportunity to join Spotify comes around. And that's when I started to find out about you is when you became the producer for the Ringer MMA show. And not just as a producer, but you've actually got a, a voice, you know, and you can call it the, the producer's voice, the voice of a fan, but you are the, the fourth man of that, of that crew. And that's when I started to kind of learn more about you and kind of really hear your voice. But Take me back to that time. When did the opportunity to join Spotify come around and then also producing the Ring Over May show? How impactful has that journey been on your life over the last couple of years? So another part of the reason why, in addition to landing a role with Chael, why I was confident in leaving ESPN was, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, Ariel's contract at ESPN was coming up in like June 2021. And he didn't tell me explicitly, but I could kind of read between the lines that he was probably going to leave ESPN. And he had pretty much assured me, if I'm out, I'm going to try to find a way to get you with me too in whatever 
I end up doing. So that kind of gave, I knew I had that in my back pocket too, that I just had to had to wait a couple months for that to happen. And so June 21 rolls around, Ariel's out at ESPN. He's talking to a bunch of different people. And he actually asked me um, for the MMA hour. He asked me if I would be interested in working on that. Um, they didn't like have anything official. This was all still very preliminary. And I said, actually that I wasn't interested because I didn't want to move to New York city. I, I had just been really getting used to the, the remote thing and being wherever I wanted. I really liked that. I had no interest in working in New York city. And also I had worked on the MMA hour at ESPN or ESPN's version of it. And me, I'm a very fidgety person. I like moving and, and being out and about and I know that that show required me to be in a dark room for five hours sitting still and very locked in and I didn't want to do that that's just not my vibe uh, but I did say thank you no thank you thank you for thinking of me I've always wanted to go to uh, the ringer when I left ESPN I'm not a corporate guy I vowed to like I'm never doing the corporate thing again, unless Spotify comes calling. I really like what they're doing at the beginning of 2021. They're clearly on the way to becoming the leaders in the space of which they are now. So I really like what they were about. I think they're a good company with good values, and I want to be a part of it. And so I knew that he was talking to The Ringer. So I said, hey, if you end up doing something at The Ringer, like I'm in on that. That's what I want. And that's exactly what happened. He signs a deal with The Ringer. He brings over PT and Chuck and me. The whole crew is back together. And since that moment, yeah, it's completely changed my life. I love working for the company. I have so much pride in working for them. The show itself is, of all the podcasts I've ever worked on, The Ringer MMA Show is by far the most fun that I've ever had working on a show. I love the camaraderie. The hosts are so good. Our fans are amazing. You know, do I enjoy waking or uh, staying up until 4 a.m. Uh, on post pay per view Saturdays ne necessarily? No, but there's honestly nothing else I'd rather be doing on a on a Saturday night with a big because you know, like we're reacting in real time to, to a big platform, a bunch of people are listening, so it's very important. Uh, it's important work that's being done, and so I'm totally cool making those sacrifices. It's fully remote. It's allowed me to live in cool places all around the world in Hawaii and the UK and Colorado. I live in New Hampshire right now, just just minutes away from the ocean. Yeah, I, I wouldn't change it. it. Like I'm waiting for something bad to happen because as you <laughs> alluded to, everything has just been on the up and up since I left ESPN. Like it's all got to come crashing down at some point, but hopefully no time soon. No, it seems like you're living the dream and what a better place to be as a podcast producer than at Spotify. Yeah. It just feels like, and I agree, it feels like they're, they are the leader in the industry. But you've mentioned it a few times already, but I actually wanted to speak to you about this and it is the remote working and it is the traveling. And as I've gotten to know you, I've been very happy for you to be able to live and have these experiences. And I always say to kind of like younger folks and nieces and nephews, and anyone that's willing to listen, the earlier you can travel and see as much of the world as feasibly possible in life, that's the best education you will ever get. So the traveling that you've been able to do because of the gig, because of the job over the last couple of years, do you feel as though that's been a way for you to, to make up for a lack of traveling earlier on in your life? Or have you always had the travel bug? And how meaningful as and impactful has the last few years been on you being able to live in places like you mentioned, Hawaii, Colorado, and the UK? Oh, it's completely changed everything, Sandu. I did not grow up this way. I actually grew up in a family that's very, like, very sheltered. Uh, I, I didn't leave, you know, I grew up a few hours away from Montreal, so I've been to Montreal a few times, went to an Expos game way back in the day. But other than that, I didn't do much traveling, uh, just not a big emphasis in my family. My mom, uh, who I adore, is just very much like a homebody and, and never really instilled in me going out of my comfort zone and going and seeing new things. That really didn't happen until I was in uh, college, actually go back to high school. So I studied history and I studied art. And I remember looking at my textbooks where I'm 
studying architecture in France and Italy, and I'm studying all these paintings, you know, from uh, Michelangelo and from uh, Van Gogh and Monet, and I just fell in love with it, and I saw where they were doing these things, and I just remember saying to myself, wow, I just want to go do these things. I want to go to these places that I'm seeing pictures of in my textbook. So that's when the seeds started to be planted, and then it was in college. Uh, my school had some really good study abroad programs, and my mom had been very uh, uh, anti me studying abroad. Anytime I brought it up, she immediately shut it down. She said, "No, don't do that. No, there's terrorists over there. What are you doing? Like you're gonna die. I'm never going to see you again." And uh, so I stu- I picked a place I wanted to go. I wanted to go to an English speaking place. So I ended up on Glasgow, Scotland, and I made. I made all the paperwork, did all the admin. I got scholarships. I actually made it out to be cheaper than what my semester at UAlbany would be. So I, then I presented it with her. Hey, I'm studying abroad. She said, no. And I said, well, no, I'm actually going and it's actually cheaper. So like this just makes sense. So she's like, OK. And then it was from that moment on, those four months in Scotland, that completely transformed my worldview. It showed me, wow, there is so much out there. There is so much that I don't know. People live a completely different life over here. Everything is different. The air is different. And I just fell in love with it. I went to a bunch of different countries in Europe as well. And so I knew from that point on that, wow, this is going to be a fixture in my life moving forward. And since then, I've been all around Europe. I haven't hit South America yet. That's that's next on the list. I'm dying to go to Rio. I just feel like some kinship with Brazil after watching all this jujitsu over the past couple of years. So I'm dying to do that. And travel has given me so much. I just returned from a 10 day trip, France, Belgium, and, and back to the UK. And every time I I go, I learned something new. I learned something new about the world, something new about myself. And I, I, I write in the book, like, I know you're young. Uh, I know money probably is hard to come by. Your paycheck is as big as you want it to be. But travel while you're young and able, because you won't always be able to do this later on in your life. You're going to have a, a, a spouse. You're going to have children. You're going to have a, a mortgage and so many bills to pay. Like There's just always going to be, as you get older, more excuses to not do things. So if you want to do it, do it now. And it's actually not that hard to make it happen. Like People think it's some, it's some crazy process. It's really actually not that hard. You can do it on the cheap. So if you need, ever need any travel tips on the cheap... Come to me because I've done it all. Well, you mentioned that you talk about these experiences in your book. So let's talk about the book. You surprised me. I had no idea (laughs) that you were working on a book. So it's called Surrender, A Guide to Living Your Best Life in Your 20s. It's available this Friday, August the 18th, as both an ebook and as a hard copy. It's available right now for pre-order. The ebook will be available on Amazon and on Google Books, and the paperback will be available in Barnes and Noble in the US and available on Amazon worldwide. I will have all the links in the show notes and if you're watching this on YouTube in the description box. The very first question I have for you, Troy, is when did you decide that you were going to write a book? So I've been writing my entire life. In middle school, I just really fell in love with writing and I I scored very well on all the essays and the exams. And so I knew I was good at it. I ended up writing like this amazing letter to my best friend, um, just telling her about how much of my best friend that she was and how amazing she was. And she cried and told me about it for years. And that that was... It was then that I knew like, wait, I I have this capacity to make people feel something with my writing. And so it's always something I, I've done, whether it's writing letters to people or journaling to myself. I've been journaling forever. I've been writing on blogs for a while. I, I ha- had a sub stack for a couple of years. And so I've always loved writing. And at some point, Probably like in college is when I said to myself, you know what, I, I want to write a book one day. And there were a couple of reasons why I wanted to write a book. One, there's the superficial reason. Wow, it would be so cool to have my name on a physical published book and to have it on my bookshelf. That would be so cool. Two, there's the other reason. Um, my I lost my best friend. Her name is Deanna Rivers. I lost her in a car crash uh, 10 years ago. It was in December of 2012 and 
everything I, I do in my life and that, and that, that singular event changed my life so much. And, and everything I do is kind of oriented around that. My entire worldview is shaped around that event. And I always knew that I wanted to use whatever skills I have to honor her. And so for me, that is writing a book. And I'm actually, um, I've dedicated this book to her on the dedication page. It said that, um, says this one's for you, D which, uh, you know, is an inside joke between she and I. And so I wanted to have something I could dedicate to her. And so then you, you know, then we get to the point of like, okay, well, what inspired me to write this book, this kind of book? That answer is, I think we have so many opportunities today to be successful, to be happy. Look at what we can do with our phones. Look at, I mean, look at what you do like your job didn't exist. My job didn't exist. You can, there's so many avenues now where you can live wherever you want, where you can structure your day, however you want, where you can, you can make your own money. You can be your own boss. You can eliminate all the gatekeepers, eliminate all the middlemen. There's so many opportunities to be happy and successful today, but yet, especially young people, we're sadder (laughs) and more depressed and dealing with more mental issues than we ever have been. So what's going on here? And so in the last seven years since I've been an adult, I've been kind of obsessed with that question. How do you live a truly meaningful and fulfilling life? What are the ingredients of that? And so everywhere I've gone, everywhere I've worked, I've gained just a lot of insights just from observing, from talking to people, from reading, listening to podcasts, writing, and just gathering all little sorts, little bits of, of wisdom that, that I've put into this book, all aimed at answering the question, how do you live the best life possible? And this is aimed at, at young people. It, it really goes for anyone, but I'm targeting young people because it is in your 20s, really, where you're, you're the most malleable. Your brain is, is the most plastic it will ever be. You know, your brain is physically developing until 26, 27 and your ability to create habits and think new things and be open is much higher in your 20s than it is when you're 45. If you're 25 and you've never exercised before, well, there's still a good chance you can probably teach yourself to f- exercise and fall in love with it and make it a mainstay of your life. Whereas if you're 45 and you've never exercised before, well, then your body is going to be feeling the effects of that. And it's going to be really hard for you, harder at 45 than 25. So it's just going to be, the deck is going to be stacked against you to try to pick up a healthy habit that uh, can last you for the rest of your life. So I'm just trying to get get to the roots of people when people are most open and most curious and and most trying to uh, you know work on themselves. And so that, that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I wrote this kind of book. Oh, well, first of all, my condolences. I had no idea about you know you losing your friend, and uh, I'm sure D would be very proud of you, you. Uh, for for getting this done. Um, can I ask Troy, what was the process like actually writing this book? Just juggling all the things that you have on your plate, and how long did it take you to get to this point where you said, "Okay, I've done it. It's finished. I'm now ready to publish." <laughs> yeah, so it's been a long process, much longer than it should have been. If I if I were squarely focused on this book and more dialed in, it would have taken, you know, it could have taken a year to do. It's not it like it it's 258 pages, but it, it's a quick read. I mean, you could read this in a day, uh, and it's an easy read. And so it took me two and a half years. I started um writing it when I was in Colorado, just after I had left ESPN and started working with Chael. And I was writing for maybe a month. Um, and it was it was at that point where I was like, wait. I think I can make this a book. Now, it's not a traditional book. It's not a, there's no story, there's no narrative. It's a collection of essays. You could theoretically pick it up at any point and just go. You can read front to back, back to front, middle to back, whatever you want. And so, with that kind of writing style, um, I was just constantly just like adding to it bit by bit, bit by bit. Um, in 2021 and two, I took a break from it uh, for a little bit. I just got into a, a relationship and that was commanding a lot of my time. And I didn't know how to prioritize. The book fell by the wayside. But then uh, in late 22, I got surgery on my hip. 
unfortunately. And so I was in recovery. And while I was in recovery, I had a lot of more still time where I couldn't do much. So I said, you know what, I'm going to focus on the book. I'm going to, I'm going to make this a reality. Up until that point, I wasn't really like super concerned with turning it into a reality. But it was at that point where I said, you know what, I'm going all in on this. I, I want this to happen. And so uh, for, you know, many for the uh, last few months of 22, 21, 22, I was, uh, I was working on it, chipping it away at it, grinding away at it. And then, uh, kind of like at the end of the year was when I started, okay, adding, removing, really started arranging it how I wanted to. I did the same in London. I did the same in Hawaii. Then I had to ask myself the question, okay, I have this book. It's pretty much done. I've done four or five rounds of edits on it. Like I'm pretty content with where it's at. Could it be could it be better? Yes. Could it could I have added more and cut more? Yes, but I'm um, you know, I didn't want to be such perfectionist that I never actually got it out. That I just never got to a place where I was cool with it. So I just kind of surrendered to the fact, all right? This is your first book. This is just what it's going to be. You're already going to learn so many lessons from this. Second one will be better, third one will be better than the second, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's put a pin in it. Then I had to ask myself, okay, there's two ways to publish a book. Go to the traditional route with publishing houses and all sorts of middlemen or self-publish. I didn't want to go the traditional route, A, because I knew it would take a lot of time and I just wanted to get it out. B, you lose a lot of artistic control in that. C, would anyone even take on a first-time author who's not proven in this space, who doesn't have a degree in this space? Like he's a podcast producer, but he he's writing the self-improvement book. What? Like maybe if you wrote a book about podcasts, then we'd look at it. So I didn't want to deal with any of that. I just want to make my dream become a reality. And so I ended up finding uh, a guy who helps self-publishing authors. And actually his name was Sean and he helped publish some of the, my favorite self-improvement books. So it was really cool to work with him. And so we've spent the last few months collaborating, going back and forth, edits, book cover, all the, all the nuts and bolts of the book process that I didn't know existed. But I'm glad uh, to know that you know I now know how to approach this thing for the next time around. So it's been two plus years in the making. Could have been tighter, but you know, lost myself in it a little bit. But now we're here. Book is 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 out. I've got pre-orders. I've got a lot of a lot of people telling me how how cool this is and how proud they are of me. And it felt so good to finally get this off my chest because I've been keeping it really close to the vest. I didn't want to tell anyone because I just wanted to write it and do it and not talk a big game. I wanted to walk the walk first, and so here we are. Yeah, well, add me to the list of people that's proud of you uh, for getting this book out. Um, Thank you, Troy. There's a lot of advice in this book for a plethora of different situations like, you know, hitting rock bottom or uh, creating core values or relationship management with friends, family, or colleagues. My question is, have you had people give you advice during your 20s that helped, you know, shape what ended up, you know, making it into this book? Or are you also drawing on your own life experiences and situations and issues you went through? And is that what is kind of driving the guidance and the advice that you give? Or would you say it's a bit of both there? It's really everything. Um, yes, a lot of what I have written about, and it's funny, it's, uh, I don't really say the word I at all in this book. Like, it's not about me. I didn't want it to be about me. It's not a memoir. But pretty much everything that I've written in this book is some, something that I did experience, something that someone told me, something that I learned from someone, something that I observed. And in the back of the book, there's a special thanks section where I where I shout out all of the people that I took uh, little bits uh, of wisdom from, whether that's documentaries I've watched, podcasts I've listened to, conversations I've had, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really just a compilation of literally everything that I have learned um, in the past seven years of, of gathering this stuff. You did tell me privately that there are a few chapters that are es essentially inspired by some very notable figures in the MMA world. Uh, yeah. Most notably, um, you know, Mountaintop, inspired by you know a situation or a story with Ariel Helwani. Then there's one called Success, 
inspired by Conor McGregor. Could you perhaps give some insight into those chapters specifically and how you drew inspiration from both Ariel and Conor there? So the mountaintop one, yes. The the gist of that basically is as you go about your career journey, your life journey, as you, you know, we're all trying to make it to to the top of the mountain, right? You know, there's a lot of advice out there about how to get to the top of the mountain, but what there isn't really a lot of uh, emphasis on is like what you do when you're at the top of the mountain or as you're climbing in terms of like, basically what I'm, what I'm positing is what I got from Ariel is as you're at the top or climbing to the top, it is your responsibility to take others with you. You and I have been beneficiaries of that for Helwani. He has helped us. Like I'm, I'm nothing in my career without him. You're probably something, but maybe not as big. Um, and he's done that for, for countless people, Chuck and PT, like I mentioned earlier. And so that, like I said earlier, I've never had a career goal. I still don't have a career goal. I still don't have like this thing that I'm working toward. What I am sure of though, is that whatever I am working toward, I want to bring as many people on the journey with me. So whether that's people I hire to help me with stuff, whether that's my friends, like getting them invites to events that I'm attending, or just like uh, recently, uh, two of my best girlfriends were at a bachelorette party and like I just sent them money, uh, like, hey, go have a good time. It's like, like anything like that um, to just help bring people along the journey with me, help them, you know, if they've played any part in my success like I want to give it back to them in some way and Ariel has done that for us so that that's what that's about and then with with regards to McGregor um I'm very fixated or fascinated with this idea of like okay similarly yeah everyone tells you okay this is how you get to the top you got to work hard and blah 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 but okay once you're actually the best in the industry once you're actually the best at what you do how the hell do you stay there that's why I'm so inspired by a guy like Israel Adesanya, who's my favorite fighter, who's at the top of kickboxing, who decides to go over to the UFC. He's now at the top of the UFC. Not only did he win the championship one time, but he's won it like seven times. And I'm just, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you not get complacent? How do you continue being the best? How do you keep that motivation? How do you continue training and finding new ways to train? Like, that is just so fascinating to me. And there's a guy like Conor McGregor, who's on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, was at the very top of the sport, top of the world for a couple of years there. And now look at him. Does he still listen? Yes, he still has a bunch of money. And some people will say, as long as you've got a bunch of money, that's all you need. But from what I've heard privately, he has a bunch of money. And that's kind of it. He doesn't really have many friends. He's not well liked. He screwed a bunch of people over. He's always having legal trouble. You're seeing what's playing out right now. Like, is he going to fight again? Is he not going to fight again? He's lost a bunch of fights within the past couple of years. My entire time following the sport, he's just been a loser, like just taking L after L after L. And so he was at the top and he completely lost himself in being there. So that's something I, I write about in the book is like, it's really hard staying at the top once you get there. Not only is it hard getting to the top, it's really hard staying there. That It might even be harder. There's one uh, segment of the book that really kind of stuck with me. And uh, if it's okay with you, I would just like to quote you from the book, just a couple of lines. It's on grudges. Mm. You say, let go of grudges, rid yourself of vendettas, forgive more readily than your ego wants you to, because you never know when people close to you could leave your life forever. And the reason this kind of uh, struck a chord with me is because this is something that as I've gotten older, I've also had to change my mindset. So my question is, is where does this piece of advice come from? Is yeah. this something that you've had to adapt and evolve and change your mindset to? And is this drawing on some personal experience? So this actually ties directly back to Deanna, my, my best friend who I lost. When we lost her, um, our friendship wasn't in the greatest spot. Now, we were like best, best friends. I've never been closer with anyone that, than I was with her. Um, but in the months leading up to her 
sudden death. We weren't in a great spot. We were squabbling over some like tiny things. So we ha- hadn't really been talking that much. I actually seen her the night before she was killed, but we just had just like a very quick interaction. And I've had to live with that for the rest of my life, that this was the girl I was closest with. And we ended on poor terms. I never got to tell her one more time how much I loved her, how much I appreciated her, and how much I, how grateful I was for having her in my life. And so I never got to tell her that again. And so I always keep that in the back of my mind. I leave every conversation with someone knowing that this could be the last time I ever see you. I know that sounds morbid. I know that sounds dark. I know that's not a pleasant way to view the world. But I legitimately have that at, at you know in the back of my mind. So I, I I hug a little harder than people would. I say I love you on the phone, even to the guys. Not all of them, but to the ones who are receptive to it. I'm very... I'm very open about my feelings toward other people. I want them to know how I feel about them because I never know when I'm not going to have the chance to say them again. So when it comes to grudges, I don't believe in holding grudges. Because if you do have a grudge with someone who ends up having an unfortunate accident, you're never going to have the chance to repair that thing with them. That's how things are going to end between you. And it's very possible that that person you have a grudge against may have meant something to you, may have been a very important person in your life at some point. But all you're going to remember is how it ended, and you have to sit with that forever. And so, since Deanna's death, and since I learned that lesson, there's been some people that I should have booted out of my life. I've been screwed over. I've had my heart stepped on. I've been backstabbed by people. But I just call me soft or whatever, but I refuse to let them totally leave my life. I, I may downplay their importance and you know move them from the primary circle to the secondary circle, but I still want them in my life because I, I don't want, if something happens to them, I don't, want, I don't want to feel that way about them forever. So that's where that one comes from. Very commendable, Troy. My final question to you regarding the book, what are you hoping readers take away from their experience reading it that there's a better life out you out there for you than what you're doing right now um like i said a lot of people are are lost and confused especially um you know in the post-pandemic world especially um you know i hear from a lot of young people about how how hard it is working from home so much or not being at the office so much and i hear about all these health issues that people are having and in this book i just basically outline a, a many different ways in many different areas of your life how you can get more out of it than you are right now this is your one chance at this um make the most of it you only get one shot live it the best that you possibly can do as many fun things as you can, make as many mistakes as you can, reach for whatever you can, stop caring what people think because it ultimately doesn't matter. The year is 2023 and and guess what? There's been like billions of years of existence. Uh, As I write, you know, like we are all just a speck of dust in the world and in world history. So why do you care so much what other people think about you? Like, it all means nothing. And I don't mean that in a morbid way. I mean that in a very freeing way, as in like, do whatever you want, make the most of this while you can, because none of it ultimately matters. But I just want people to to live a better life. Like I'm living an amazing life a life that I never, ever thought possible for myself. But I, I've, I've put in the work and I'm sharing that uh, with the world because I want other people to to have the the experiences and, and all the love and the gratitude that I have every day, which is just an amazing way to live. Are there hard days? Of course. Is my life perfect? Absolutely not. I suffer from my own mental issues from time to time. I definitely get lonely. That's the one that I that I fall most uh, most privy to. But all in all, like I'm extremely grateful for the life I have, and I'd want other people to feel the same ways that I do. Well, best of luck with it. And like I already mentioned to you, it is a very easy read. You don't have to even read this book chronologically. You can just jump in, you know, here and there, you know, read a little bit, maybe take some inspiration or some some guidance or advice. You know, it might just change your day. Um, so like I said, I'm going to 
you know, link everything in the show notes and the description, whether you want to buy it electronically or, or a hard copy. But before I let you go, Troy, we've got to talk about your MMA fandom, oh, right? Please. Because because this is predominantly an, an MMA show. And I'm just very curious about your MMA fandom because I feel like over the last three, four, five years, there has been an explosion of new fans in the sport. And you are very, in my opinion, representative of that. You know, the ESPN deal, you know, sports betting has just changed the entire landscape. How did you actually become an MMA fan? Were you already a fan before, you know, working in the industry professionally, or did that actually help evolve your fandom for the sport? Yeah, before I started working on it, I was vaguely aware of it. Um, the first thing that ever I was fascinated with was Ronda Rousey because I was a mainstream sports fan. And here's this woman named Ronda Rousey who keeps winning all of these ESPY awards. And I'm like, who is this person? I have no idea who this is. Uh, and so I remember seeing that she had a fight coming up. Um, and I, I, for some reason, I was strangely interested in like rumors of her battling Cyborg. Uh, I would read articles like, oh, Ronda Rousey and Cyborg. Like, who is this Cyborg person? That sounds wild. Like, what is this sport? Uh, and so I, I made sure to watch Ronda Rousey fight. I don't remember who she fought, but it was one of her very uh, close finishes. I remember walking around uh, the Saratoga in upstate New York telling my friend, like, I know Ronda's fighting tonight. Can we just pop into a bar really quick to watch her fight? Ended in 20 seconds or whatever, and we were out. So that was my introduction to it. But still, I, I didn't catch the bug from that. Like, I'd heard of Conor McGregor, didn't know who he was. I thought Daniel Cormier and John Jones were boxers. I, I kept seeing their names on like in headlines, but I didn't know it was for UFC. It wasn't until I got to ESPN where I really started knowing what um, UFC was. And actually, just when I started in podcasting was just as ESPN had acquired the UFC rights. And as um, as I was the low man on the totem pole, again, this time in podcasting, my bosses were like, Troy, we don't know what this thing really is, this UFC thing. You go figure it out. We have this show with Ariel Hawani. You go do it. And I was like, oh, all right, sure. Uh, and then so I start working on uh, the Hawani show, the ESPN version of the MMA hour. I'm sitting in a cold, dark studio for five hours where my sole job is on the audio side of things, just to take care of the podcast afterwards. Anytime that there's a, a swear word, like just cut it out. That's your job and put the podcast up. So I got very, very familiar with Israel Adesanya in 2019 because uh, he was uh, having a lot of appearances. Same with Jorge Masvidal and Leon Edwards and Colby Covington. And I got very familiar with, with these people and they were fascinating to me. I, w I still wasn't watching the fighting. Uh, it took a couple months for me to actually watch a fight, and I didn't do it by choice. I just happened to be working on a weekend, and the fights happened to be on, and it was Adesanya versus Calvin Gastelum. And I saw, um, I was like, wait, I, I know that guy. That's I, I've heard his voice. Like it, I can hear it in my ears right now. It's Adesanya guy. And that fight, as you remember, was just wild. And that was the moment where I was like, yo. <laughs> I'm into this. This is this is cool. And so from that point, I was pretty much hooked. And then I actually got to go to some pay-per-views for work. I went to uh, 244, the BMF belt. The first fight I ever went to was the BMF. So BMF, I'm here for it. It means a lot to me. I went to 44, 245, 246. So that was a McGregor fight, McGregor versus Cerrone. So got to go to that and see that side of it. And that was crazy. And then obviously COVID hit. And then sports went away, but UFC didn't go away. And so then working at it, like we were in the thick of it. We were still going. I got really, really, really into it. GC from the MMA Hour. Uh, I got him into it. And he started betting on it because he had nothing to bet on. And then pretty much from that, it's just been up and up and up and up. And like, it's given me everything, Sandu. It's given me friends. It's given me amazing opportunities, amazing memories. Uh, I just went on a trip to Europe with a friend I've met from MMA Twitter. Like it's this wild thing that um, that it's done for me. And, you know, I've been to Bellator now and I've been to Cage Warriors and I've been to LFA. I haven't been to PFL yet, but I'm sure that will happen. It's a uh, it's a fun time. I, I'm I am starting to lose like a little bit of the like deer in the headlights about it. It's kind of happened at the end of last year. Just kind of like there was the Patty, Dana, uh, and Ariel thing. Then Dana had his, uh, you know, transgressions and 
the Nganu thing, like just a bunch of stuff showing the the shadier side of the sport that has, you know, brought me back down to earth a little bit. And so I'm not like all gung ho supporting it all uh, anymore. But all in all, like like Ariel, like like you, like all of us, it all comes back to just love and admiration and respect for the fighters and what they're doing. I, I think these athletes are the most courageous on the planet. So much love to them. Yeah, couldn't have said it better myself. I think at some point when you work in the business, like we both do at some point, you know, when you start to see how the sausage is made, it can turn you off a lot of elements with the sport. But like you said, it's all about the athletes and the fighters and their journeys and their stories. And it's just incredible what they're able to do for, for our entertainment. Uh, before I let you go, Troy, and I really appreciate your time, um, based upon your MMA fandom, I would just love to get your take on some big fights coming oh up later oh on this year. I know, I, know, I know you are known to have a hot take or two. Um, <laughs> so I'd love to get your thoughts first of all, uh, and if I may get a prediction with regards to Tyson Fury versus mm -hmm. Francis Ngannou in the boxing ring. I mean, that's easy money for Tyson Fury. Um, I don't see a world in which Francis Ngannou lands a big punch um, on Tyson. Well, I mean, he'll land big punches, but not a knockout punch. Tyson Fury can can definitely take them. I mean, it, I mean, isn't Deontay Wilder and Francis Ngannou, like, isn't Deontay Wilder like a step above Ngannou probably? And like, oh, wait, by the way, Wilder's actually a boxer and, and Ngannou isn't. So I'm like, th you're, this is Tyson Fury versus a knockoff Deontay Wilder. And Fury's beaten Wilder convincingly a couple of times. So yeah, give me give me Fury and I don't think it's close. Well, something that's a little bit closer to home. The 30th anniversary UFC card this year in Madison Square Garden will be headlined by arguably the greatest of all time in, in John Jones, taking on arguably the greatest heavyweight of all time in Stipe Miocic. What is your level of anticipation heading into that event and that fight in particular? And how do you think it plays out? Very excited to be there. Um, New York City, not that far off, so I'll definitely be there. 30th anniversary, we'll definitely be there. MSG puts on a great show. For the fight itself, though, I'm probably going to be looking forward to the fights on the undercard more, and I don't even know what they are yet, but I'm pretty sure I will be. I mean, we saw with John Jones, it is surreal gone. Like, we know John Jones is... Uh, is still a spring chicken. I mean, that performance was pretty incredible. Steve Miocic, on the other hand, is not. Hasn't fought in a couple of years now. How hard has he been training? We know he went from part-time firefighter to full-time firefighter. Like, all, all the respect and love for him. But I just don't know how dedicated he is to this. I don't know how much this fight means to him. It took it took a while to to get him to sign on the dotted line, as, as far as I know. So... I, I like John in this. I, I like it very convincingly for him. Um, you know, I think John finishes him within two rounds. Well, look, Troy, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. Um, once again, the book is entitled Surrender, A Guide to Living Your Best Life in Your 20s. All the links, like I said, will be in the description and in the show notes. I appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate you agreeing to produce my show. Uh, but most of all, I appreciate your friendship. It's been great uh, just getting to know you. You know, we first met uh, in person during International Fight Week 2022. I was already familiar with who you were, your work and your your persona on the Ringer MMA show. But just getting to know you on a much deeper, meaningful, more personal level, both professionally and personally over the last 12 months um, has been an absolute pleasure. And it was an, an easy yes when uh, we spoke about you coming on the show to talk about your book, but also talk about your career, your life, and your passion for mixed martial arts. So thank you for coming on, Troy. I really appreciate it. And also best of luck with the first of hopefully many books to come in the future. Thank you, Sandu, for all the kind words. Likewise, for your friendship and for having me. You're one of the best in the business. And of course, I want to work with the best in the business. So this is uh, this has been great. Thank you for everything. Look forward to seeing you in London at some point in the near future. I know we got to make that happen. I love London. You love London. So much love until then. Absolutely. Take care, Troy. Speak to you soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.